Well, it's great to be in the Lord's house. Amen? Great to be in the Lord's house, and I'm delighted to get to be here with Pastor Paul. I have been looking forward to come, coming, and I have been looking forward to sharing. And uh, we just believe in and trust in God for a great week. I have been praying, I can say with integrity. I wasn't for sure about what I was going to preach up to just a matter of minutes ago. I've been praying about what the Lord would have me to share it. Kind of reminds me of the story of uh, the two seventh graders that were madly in love. <laughs> they were just madly in love. And actually, the little girl's mom and dad started getting concerned. They said, This relationship's getting very serious. Perhaps we ought to invite this little boy over to our house for dinner one night and uh, just make sure he's okay. And so uh, they did, and the couple said, Hey, this is great. It'd kind of be like our first date. And uh, so the little boy goes down to the local drugstore, just a small town, goes down to the local drugstore, and he says to the druggist, he says, uh, I want to get a five-pound box of candy, I want to get a three-pound box of candy, and I want to get a one-pound box of candy. And the druggist said, well, now, son, why would you want a five-pound box of candy, a three-pound box of candy, and a one-pound box of candy? He said, well, let me explain. I'm getting ready to go on my first date. And he said, before I go in the door, I'm going to hide this candy in the yard. And he said, if, if the date goes well and uh, she's nice to me, I'm going to give her the one-pound box of candy. But he said, if I get to hold her hand, I'm going to give the three-pound box of candy. But he said, if I get to do what I really want to do, and that's lay a kiss on her, I'm going to give her the five-pound box of candy. So he gets the candy, hides the candy in the yard, knocks on the door. The mother comes to the door and she says, well, son, come right on in. Dinner's on the table. He walks into the dining room. Dinner's on the table. And the father says, let's pray. And the little boy says, do you mind if I pray? They say, no, no, go ahead. And so he prays and 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 he prays. And he prays. <laughs> Finally, he finishes and his girlfriend said, I didn't know that you were so religious. He said, and I didn't know that your dad was a town druggist. Amen? <laughs> well, I've been praying. I've been praying. And I'm excited to be here tonight. Now, let me tell you something, folks. It's okay to laugh. I tell pastors, I travel, I, I preach somewhere just about every night. I told my wife the other day, I said, honey, I'm going too much. She said, why do you say you're going too much? I said, well, the other day I pulled up at the mailbox, ordered a Big Mac and ordered fries and circled the house. Amen? <laughs> I'm going too much. But I tell pastors, your church will grow by 10% if you'll just teach your people to smile. Your church will grow by 10% if you'll just teach your people to smile. You say, well, pastor, I don't have any teeth. Well, just gum me to death. Amen? <laughs> I mean that. God came to give us everlasting life and he came to give us everlasting life. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Amen? Amen? So I'm just delighted to get to be here. This brother was back there. He was over there and now he's here. Good to have you, brother. God. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere. <laughs> so now to be his last night. All right, okay. I want to invite you to take your Bible and stand. Can we do that? We're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want to call your attention to verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1. This is what the scripture says. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, how he was caught up into paradise. And I heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, 
But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he, is, which he seeth me to be or heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure. Through the abundance of revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, when I am weak, then I am strong. Let us pray. Lord, as we bow our heads and our hearts in your presence, I thank you for the honor and privilege of being here with Pastor Paul, Sister Beth, and the wonderful people of this congregation. I pray tonight, Lord, that you'll speak to us and through us. Because, God, I've been doing this long enough. Unless you come, Lord, everything I'd have to say will be vanity and vexation. But if you come tonight, God, and you place your hand upon your servant, Lord. God, you'll give us a word. You'll give us a rhema word for the people. And so, God, that's what we ask for tonight. I pray you'll speak to us and through us. I pray for that man, woman, boy, girl that might be here tonight that don't know you. I pray they'll come to know you. And, God, meet the needs of this congregation. And for all you do, we'll bow our unworthy heads and we'll praise you. For I pray this prayer tonight in Jesus' name, for Christ's sake. Until you come, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I say to you tonight what Elizabeth Taylor said to her, her eighth husband. I'm not going to keep you long. <laughs> but I do want to take just a little while. And I want to talk to you about the man who went to heaven and came back. The man who went to heaven and came back. I heard about a couple that was planning to get married. And on the way to get the groom's tux, they had a terrible automobile accident. Both of them were tragically killed. But they were Christians, so they went to heaven. And this young couple, after they got to heaven, one day they saw Peter. And they said, Peter, down on earth, we were wanting to get married, planning to get married. We was just wondering, is there any way we could get married here in heaven? Peter said, let me check into it. A year passed, and they saw Peter again. Peter said, let me check into it. Two years passed, and they saw Peter, and Peter said, let me check into it. Finally, after five years, Peter saw the couple. And he said, I've got great news. You can get married. They said, Peter, we've been thinking about it. What if it doesn't work out? <laughs> Is there any recourse? Is there any avenue for divorce here? Peter said, I don't know about all this. It's taken me five years to find a preacher. <laughs> what do you think the hopes are of finding an attorney? Amen. <laughs> I love the story about the preacher who stood up one day and he was making an object lesson to his congregation. He said, everybody that wants to go to heaven, stand up. And everybody stood up. Then he said, everybody that wants to go to hell, stand up. One little boy stood up. He said, son, you miss, must have misunderstood me. I said, everybody who wants to go to hell, stand up. Why would you stand up? He said, Preacher, I didn't want you standing alone. <laughs> now I want to talk to you tonight about the man in the Bible who went to heaven and came back. There's three observations I want you to see. The first observation I want you to see is the vision of the apostle. The vision of the apostle. Now Paul said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years. Now Paul was speaking of himself 
but he was speaking in third person. It's believed that this happened between 42 and 44 A.D. when Paul was left for dead at Lystra. Paul said, I knew a man in Christ speaking of himself above 14 years. Basically 14 years had passed before Paul would even address this subject. And Paul said, whether he was in the body or whether he was out of the body, I cannot tell. Paul said, I don't know if this was a physical experience. I don't know if it was a spiritual experience. All I know is unequivocally, I was caught up to the third heaven. All I know is I was caught up to the third heaven. There's the atmospheric heaven, the first heaven. There's the astronomic heaven, the second heaven. But then there's the angelic heaven, the dwelling place of God. And Paul said, I was caught up. I literally was caught up to the very dwelling place of God. Now as I began to research this scripture, I re researched that caught up. Now keep in mind, the New Testament was written in Greek. And that terminology, caught up, comes from the Greek word harpazo. And I began to research, is that anywhere else in the Bible? And I found it was in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got good news. One of these days, we're going to be caught up. Amen? Amen. One of these days, the trumpet's going to toot and we're going to scoot. Amen? One of these days, we're not going to take an airplane flight. We're going to take a plane air flight. Folks, he hadn't promised us preservation. He's promised us evacuation. Amen? Oh, folks, let me tell you, if we know the Lord, if you know the Lord, you shouldn't be looking for the undertaker. You ought to be looking for the upper taker. You shouldn't be looking for a hole in the ground. You ought to be looking for a hole in the sky. You shouldn't be looking looking for the Antichrist, you ought to be looking for Jesus Christ. Because one day, I'm going to stand before my boss, take my loss, eat my supper, and come back on my halls. Amen? We're going to leave here like Superman and come back like the Lone Ranger. One day, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be caught up. Now, you know what's amazing? If it wasn't for my Methodist dignity, I'd shout. Listen, folks. He said, I was caught up into the very presence of God. Now, here's what's amazing, folks. He didn't come back and go on Oprah. He didn't come back and go on Dr. Phil. He didn't come back and write a book about one of these out-of-the-body experiences. You say, well, Pastor, I buy those out-of-the-body experience books. Well, well, don't walk through the woods slowly tonight. The squirrels will eat you. You're nuts. No, no, no. Am I in the book? He said, what happened to me? It's not even lawful for me to talk about. What I saw, am I in the book, folks? What I saw, what I experienced there, is not even lawful for me to talk about. But here is amazing, folks. He did say these words in Romans 8 and 18. He said, for I reckon, that tells me right there, Paul was from the South. 
ought to be southern born, southern bred. When I die, I'll be Dixie dead. Amen. <laughs> he said, for I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to the glory that shall be revealed in us. You say, Pastor, what's, what's heaven going to be like? I don't know. But I think about this. I think about the story of Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer's a golfer. You say, Pastor Benny, are you a golfer? Oh, no, no. If I could do it in about 20 minutes, I'd do it. I told my wife the other day, I said, honey, I've taken some cold medicine. It's making me, it's made me so hyper. She said, my goodness, how can you tell? <laughs> Arnold Palmer flew over to Saudi Arabia and he gave the king of Saudi golf lessons. And when he was getting ready to go, the king said, I want to give you a gift. Arnold said, no, you've treated me like a king. He said, no, no, I want to give you a gift. And he said, well, as strange as it may sound, King, I collect golf clubs. He said, I'll send you one. And old Arnold Palmer said he came back to the States and he said, I got to thinking, will it be a gold golf club? Will it be a putter with a ruby in it? Will it be a diamond in the driver? But he said, three weeks passed and I got a certified letter from Saudi Arabia. And he said, I opened it up, and it was a deed to a 500-acre golf club. <laughs> and I thought about this, folks. I have not seen, neither has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God had prepared for him. When we think about heaven, we're thinking about a golf club. But God said, heaven is a golf club. Yes. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I see the vision of the apostle. But I want you to see something else. I see the vexation of the apostle. Look what verse 7 says. It says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now wait, the man who was caught up to the dwelling place of God had a vexation, had a thorn. The man who had been in his presence, somebody said, Pastor, you just got to name it, claim it. You just got to believe it, receive it. You just health and wealth, just blab it and grab it. Oh, folks, if you believe that, don't sleep on your side tonight. Your brains will roll out your ears. <laughs> Let me tell you something. The life that pleases God is often painful and difficult. Yes, this man that was caught up to the very presence of God, he had a thorn. Somebody said, Brother Benny, what was it? What was his thorn? Somebody said, Paul was married. It was his mother-in-law. What was it? <laughs> Scripture doesn't say Paul was married. Now, Peter was. Jesus healed his mother-in-law, remember? That's why Peter denied him. <laughs> now, wait. Paul said to keep me humble. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Been asked a lot of times, Brother Benny, who's the greatest Christian you ever met? A few years ago, I was in Billy Graham's home with him for an hour. That's a real honor. But let me tell you, he's not the greatest Christian I ever met. Greatest Christian I ever met is my wife. Let me tell you folks, for 32 years of marriage, I've never known her to miss a day having her time with the Lord. 32 years. 
And Don, if you called her right now, you said, Barbara, do you pray for Betty every day? Every day. And then you said, Barbara, what do you pray? Oh, she said, oh, I pray the same prayer. God, you keep him humble. Because if you don't keep him humble, you can't use him. If you don't keep him humble, you say, Pastor Benny, why? You preached to 3,000 this morning. What are you doing down here tonight? Let me tell you something. If you're too big for the small church, you're too small for the big church. Yeah, if you're too big for the small church, you're too small for the big church. And somebody said, Pastor, what was this? What was this thorn? Somebody said it was his eyesight. You remember he said in Galatians 4 and 15, when I first came to you, you would have plucked your eyes out and given them to me. Now I'm your enemy because I tell you the truth. Somebody said it was his eyesight. I don't know. Somebody said, Pastor Benny, it wasn't his eyesight. It was he had a speech impediment. I don't know about a speech impediment, but I know the Corinthians like Apollos is preaching better than Paul because Paul was long-winded. I preach on Sunday morning, some of them will shake Mickey, worrying about the Baptist beating them to the restaurant. Somebody said he was is speaking. I don't know. Somebody said he was his, his adversaries. You know, he said Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's things that we don't know. There's things that we don't understand. I don't understand how we eat three square meals and end up round, but we do. Amen? And I'm not, I'm not picking on anybody. There's blessings to being a little bit overweight. Amen. Don't take near as much water in the bathtub. <laughs> now listen. There are things that we don't know. But here's what I want you to see. God silences are significant because if we knew what the thorn was we might put a greater emphasis on one problem above another we might put a greater emphasis on a marital problem than a physical problem we might put a greater emphasis on an emotional problem than a financial problem we might put a greater emphasis on one problem than another problem but what God's trying to teach us is this ladies and gentlemen Paul went into the presence of God no Christian like him other than Jesus. But he still had problems. He still had thorns. He still had trials. And if you live for Jesus, you'll have problems. You'll have trials. You'll have difficulties. See, I see the vision of the apostle. I see the vexation of the apostle. But I want you to see something else. The victory of the apostle. The victory of the apostle. I want you to see three quick things. Number one, Paul's request. He said, I sought the Lord three times. Three times. Take it away. Somebody said, you, sometimes you just speak it, Brother Benny, wait. A guy called me and he said, Brother Benny, if God's told me that if you'll give me a hundred dollars, God will give you a thousand. I said, friend, do you really believe that? He said, oh, yes. I said, well, then you give me the hundred. That way you'll get the thousand. <laughs> I'm some dumb, but not plum dumb. <laughs> See, Paul's request, but well, look, God's refusal. Verse 9. My grace is sufficient. He didn't get what he wanted, ladies and gentlemen, but he got what he needed. And grace is God supplying my needs day to day as I need them. Paul's request, God's refusal.
But then, Paul's realization. Look at verse 10. He said, for when I am weak, then I am strong. The great preacher R.A. Torrey said, I doubt that God can bless a man greatly until he hurts him deeply. Charles Stanley said, God can't bless you until he bleeds you. It's a crushed rose that produces a fragrance. It's a crushed grape that produces juice. See, I want you to know something. Three observations. Satan brings the pain. Observation number two, God allows it. Observation number three, behind the pain, lies the purpose of God. Satan brings the pain. God allows it. And behind the pain lies the purpose of God. I was preaching a while back, Brother Paul, and after I was preaching, I was signing books. And a gentleman said to me, was your dad a pastor? Was your granddad a pastor? And I said, if you'll wait just a minute, I'll tell you my story. And then we stepped over to the side. I wish, Paul, that my dad had been a pastor like yours. I've often wondered what would have became of my ministry if that would have been the story. But from the earliest I can remember, we was running a package store. After that, nightclubs. After that, selling whiskey illegal. Now see, my mother met a man that was a professional gambler. And they spent one or two nights together. And I came into existence. And I grew up raised by a stepfather who was abusive as abusive could be. He'd beat my mother, beat my sister and myself, just as dysfunctional life as dysfunctional could be. When I was 16 years old, my mother left and things were better for a little while. And then one day I go to my mom's bed. I'd never been in church with my mother. I'd never been in church, period. But I go to my mom's bed, and she stays in bed. And she's depressed because the relationship that she was involved with went south. And my mom decided that life wasn't worth living, and she'd end her life. She got in a red Thunderbird, Hubbard's Cove, Tennessee, Drove to her first cousin's house in Manchester, Tennessee. Planning to end her life. And she knocked on the door and said to her first cousin, Shirley, can I stay a few days with you all? Planning to do it there where I wouldn't find her. And Shirley said to my mother, you can stay a few days with us, but we're not the people we used to be. We used to party and carouse with you. But we went down to Temple Baptist Church and we got saved. And more than anything, Melba, you need to get saved. They said, can we call our pastor Gary Jackson and let him come and talk to you? And he came and talked to my mother. And my mother accepted Jesus Christ. I've often thought the very place that mama went to end her life, she found life. <laughs> the very place. Tell me, tell me God can't take what the devil means for evil and turn around and use it for good. The next morning, my mother pulled up driving that red Thunderbird. She got out and she's got red hair. Don, I mean this. I've, you've heard this story a thousand times. But Don, my mother looked different. She had a glow about her. 
She just looked different. I mean, she was different. She said, Brother Benny, I don't know about all that. Somebody said after hearing Brother Benny preach, you may not believe what he believes, but you'll believe he believes what he believes. She just looked different. <laughs> My mama said to me, Benny, I hadn't raised you right. I'm ashamed of the way I've raised you. I'm ashamed of the way I've raised you. But last night, your mama got saved. Last night, your mama gave her life to Christ. And more than anything, Benny, you need to give your life to Christ. And mama's bedroom was here. And my bedroom was here. And mama didn't know how to pray. Mama had never been in church. She'd ran taverns. She'd ran nightclubs. She'd sold whiskey illegal. She'd done everything under the sun. But my mother would go to bed each night and I'd hear in the bedroom, Oh, God, save Benny. Oh, God, save Benny. Don't let Benny go to hell. Oh, God, save Benny. I don't want my boy going to hell. Don't let Benny go to hell. And I'd say, Oh, God, don't let Benny go to hell. <laughs> Finally, one night about midnight, I said, Mama, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. Let me tell you something, folks, it still works. It works for that husband that's away from God. It works for that child that's away from God. It works for that family member that's away from God. When we keep bombarding heaven, I want you to know it still works. God still answers prayer. God can still draw them no matter what the situation they're in. And I said, Mama, I want to get right with the Lord. And she said, let's call the pastor. And the pastor came at midnight. And the pastor said, Benny, you got to pray. I said, I don't know how to pray. He said, well, all you got to do is ask the Lord to forgive you. Just pray a simple prayer. And young people, it's, it's not the length of the prayer. It's the strength of the prayer. It's the strength of the prayer. Just a few words can change your life. I can prove it. I do. I do will change your life. I prayed. I asked Christ to come into my heart. I looked at Brother Clayton. I said, Brother Clayton, I feel like a tow motor was on top of me, but it's been lifted off. Don't you thank God for salvation? Don't you think? I've never gotten over a man dying for me. I thank God that God thought it. Jesus brought it. The blood bought it. The Bible taught it. The Holy Spirit wrought it. The devil fought it and I caught it. I'm glad I got saved. Amen? I'm glad I got saved. Never been the same. Never been the same. I started trying to live for the Lord. After a little while, I said, God's called me to preach. 17 years old, 17 years old in a little church asked me, will you be our pastor? I was high energy, low IQ. <laughs> I preached messages from the book of Pisms. <laughs> one day I was teaching, one day I was teaching and one of the ladies said, Pastor, what is this, the epistles? What does it mean when the Bible says the epistles? I said, that's the apostles' wives. <laughs> but this is what I've learned, ladies and gentlemen. God honors availability more than he does ability. Somebody said, I'm praying that God will use me. I'm praying that God will use me. Quit praying that prayer. Get usable and he'll wear you out. He'll wear you out because he wants to use you. He wants to use your life. I reached 30 years of age. And my sister said, somebody wants to meet you. I said, Rhonda, who would want to meet me? She said, your daddy wants to meet you. I never met my daddy. My daddy wants to meet me. She said, yes. So I went to this location and I saw my dad. I never laid eyes on him. We spent some time together. As we was getting ready to wrap up, I said, let me ask you something, Don. Are you a Christian? He said, well, son, let me explain. He said, I've been a professional gambler all my life. But about two years ago, I staggered into a church and I gave my life to Christ. 
And he said, many times in large settings, I've came to hear you preach. He said, I'd go back to the table and I'd get everything off your table. I said, I hope you paid for it. (laughs) But he said, let me share with you. Your mother was in sin. I was in sin. I've thought about all the people that God used you to reach. And he said, I've often thought, what your mother and I meant for evil, God turned around and used for good. I found out I had three brothers. I prayed the sinner's prayer with every one of them. See, this is what I know, folks. Satan brings the pain. God allows it. And behind the pain lies the purpose of God. We can learn a lot from the man who went to heaven and came back. Amen? We can learn a lot from the man who went to heaven and came back. I want the musicians to come. I want the musicians to come. I want us to get maybe just as I am if we could, brother. I want the musicians to come. I want us to get just as I am. And just for a moment, every head's bowed and every eye's closed. Just for a moment, every head's bowed and every eye's closed. As they softly play. Pastor, I'm here tonight. And you said that Satan brings the pain. And God allows it. But behind the pain lies the purpose of God. Brother Benny, I'm here tonight and I don't know that my heart's right with Jesus Christ. I don't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I know I don't want to go to hell. Pastor Benny, I want you to pray for me tonight. Because I'm concerned about where I will spend eternity when I die. There's not a soul looking but me and God. But if you'd like for me to pray for you tonight, I want to ask you to slip your hand up and say, pray for me, Brother Benny. God bless you. 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 I wonder tonight, you'd say, Brother Benny, I'm just going through a tough time in my life just going through a real tough time please pray for me you slip up your hand yes now listen to me very closely if you're here tonight you'd say brother Benny I don't know that I'm right with God but I want to get right with God I want you to repeat this prayer with me right there in your pew pray this prayer with me just repeat this prayer Lord Jesus I'm a sinner But God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm so sorry I want to change. I believe that you died for my sin. And I confess them to you right now. Come into my heart, Lord. Come into my life. And forgive me. Now thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Thank you for coming into my life. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Hello, I'm Pastor Paul Brown with First Independent Methodist Church here in Dublin. We would like to extend a special invitation for you to join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. for Sunday school, 11 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. for worship service. We also have two Bible studies every Wednesday at 3 and 7 p.m. At First Independent Methodist Church, you'll be a part of a caring and loving church family who want to share the love of Christ with you. We have something going on for all ages, whether it be our children's church, our wonderful youth program, Sisters in Christ, our men's ministry, or one of our Bible studies. 
We are so excited about what God is doing at FIMC. Also, please tune in to our services every Saturday night at 8 p.m. here on TV35. We look forward to seeing you this Sunday at First Independent Methodist Church on Claxton Dairy Road in Cardinal Drive. I pray that you will come and be a part of our family this week.